Welcome back to our study in the book of Genesis. So we're looking at Genesis chapter 36. And we're looking at the generations of Esau. Remember the Bible is a library of 66 different books. The book of Genesis has been outlined in a number of different ways. One the way that is often overlooked is to see it divided into ten places where we see the formula, these are the generations, used as a refrain. It is a formula that takes place throughout the entire book. In the second chapter we read of the generations of the heaven and earth. After that we read of the generations of Adam, of Noah, of Shem, of Abraham, Ishmael and Isaac. Now we come to still another generation. It's a record of the generations of Esau. Genesis 36. Now these are the records of the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. As we read through this chapter, we are confronted with a very long list of names and places that are mainly unfamiliar to us. If the truth were told, we are usually inclined to skip this section and to proceed on to the next chapter. In doing so, we would miss some hidden treasures that lie waiting for us to discover. When we hear this reference to generations, it should serve as a reminder to us of something that we've been seeing all through the book of Genesis, it is a promise of two seeds. You'll recall the setting in which this promise was made it was in the Garden of Eden. The first man, the first woman, had eaten of the forbidden fruit. This brought about a terrible change. Whereas before the garden had been a place of love, now this love was replaced by bitter enmity. This verse provides the theme of the rest of Genesis. This will, will be a book about two seeds. On the one hand will be the seed of woman. Every person who has ever been born has been a descendant of Adam and Eve by default. They are the progenitors of the human race. But there's something more that is taking place in this passage than a natural uneasiness in the presence of snakes. We see two seed lines. The seed of the woman is ultimately Jesus Christ. He is born of a virgin and without the contribution of man. In a very real sense, he can be called the seed of woman. He is seen in the contrast to the seed of the serpent. The serpent is a reference to the person of Satan. In Revelation 12, we see Satan described as that old serpent. There are two promised seeds. They are not merely the physical seeds. They are the spiritual descendants of Christ and Satan. God initially created all life to produce after its kind. But man rebelled and sinned against God, and so a promise was given. It was a promise of the two seeds. The promise is found in Genesis 3.15. The first seed was to be the seed of the serpent. It was a seed of rebellion. It was a seed of sin. It was made up of all who walked in the way of Adam in disobedience and in turning against God. But it's also a second seed promised. It is the seed of the woman. The second seed is set over against the first seed. The two seeds are at war with one another. God has decreed that the second seed shall ultimately win. From our vantage point, we know that this second seed is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the one who is bruised for our iniquities as he crushed underfoot the serpent's head. The rest of Genesis is the story of these two seeds. First we read of Cain and Abel. Although they were brothers descended from the same father and mother, Cain shows himself to be of the spiritual seed of the serpent by murdering his brother. But God replaces murder Abel with Seth. We see the genealogy of each. Cain's seed leads to Lamech, a man who is willing not only to murder a man, but to compose the song in which he boasts of his deed. Seth's seed leads us to Enoch, who walks with God, and from there to Noah, who is spared the destruction of the flood. But this story doesn't stop there. Noah has three sons. One of them performs an evil deed which demonstrates he is of the spiritual seed of the serpent. He and his descendants through Canaan are cursed. The impact of this would not be missed on the Israelites to whom Moses wrote Genesis. Noah's other son, Shem, is given the promise of blessing. The Babel rebellion is an account of men trying to make a Shem for themselves. Shem is a Hebrew word for name that is dispersed among the nations. But one is called out to be a blessing to the nations. His name is Abraham. 
He has two sons, one is seen to be of the seed of the serpent, he is cast out, the other of the spiritual seed of God, he is Isaac. Isaac also has two sons, they are twins. The one is Jacob, while the other is the person who is the subject of this particular chapter. He is Esau. He has already given some indication of whose seed he is. He has shown no particular interest in the birthright of God. He was willing to trade his spiritual birthright for a bowl of stew. By that action, Esau was showing something about himself. He was showing his spiritual heritage. He was showing that he was spiritually of the seed of the serpent. This is not said in order that you might point to the Edomites or to Esau and say, shame on you. It is said in order we might ask the question, whose seed am I? Am I following the Lord or have I been following in the footsteps of the serpent? If you've come to trust in Jesus Christ, your Lord and Saviour, and you've been born again, there's a new seed. You've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and abiding Word of God. Having said this, there are another two avenues of consideration for us. First, we are impressed with the fact that Esau was a very gracious man. While he had in the heat of anger threatened to kill his brother for his deception, he received him warmly. If you're reading the story of Esau and uh, Jacob from a a human perspective, you would look uh, at Esau, okay, he he wasn't a spiritual man, but he seemed overall to be a far better character than Jacob. And yet Jacob is the one through whom the spiritual seed was to be gone. When prosperity necessitated, he moved out of his brother's way. So you see him in a a really a a better light than Jacob. If God elected for service one or the other of these two twins on the basis of likability, I think he would have probably chosen Esau, because Esau really is is a nicer character. At least that is what I would have chosen. While Esau had no regard for spiritual things, he had many fine qualities. In 3668, it was Esau who moved out of Jacob's way, just as Abraham gave way to Lot. God's choices for service are not necessarily more likable people, nor are they any more gracious and kind. Second, while Esau was rejected on a spiritual plane, yet he was nonetheless a recipient of the common grace of God. Abraham begged God to bless his son by Hagar Ishbel, which he did. Apart from any recorded request by Isaac on Esau's behalf, God still greatly blessed and prospered Esau. This even extended to God's command to Israel not to attack the Edomites, nor to take any of their territory when we get to Deuteronomy Numbers. Esau took his wife from the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ohalabah, the daughter of Anna, and the granddaughter of Zibion, the Hivite. Also, Basimath, Ishmael's daughter, the sister of Neboeth, and Ada bore Elizabeth to Esau, and Basimath bore Ruel. Olahab, Banahab, bore Jeresh, and Jelal, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, who were born to him in the land of Canaan. Marriages in the ancient world were often arranged by the parents. It was for this reason that Abraham had made his servant Eliakim swear an oath that he would not choose a wife for Isaac from among the daughters of the Canaanites. The same way, Jacob had been sent by his father to Haran with explicit instructions that he not take a wife from the daughters of the Canaan. Of Canaan. What was wrong with the Canaanites? Well, they were idolaters. They worshipped false gods. They would infect the people of God with those same false systems of worship. There's an old saying that goes, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, and there's a lot of truth in that statement. Women have a tremendous ability to influence their children. There's a sense in which the continuation of Christianity is always dependent upon the evangelization of the next generation, and this ministry lies primarily in the hands of Christian mothers. Esau took a number of wives, and to make matters worse, all of these wives were from among the Canaanites. They brought the false gods into the marriage with them. There's no more important decision that a man and a woman can make them than in, mar- in the matter of marriage. 
The Bible advice is very specific. Believers are advised not to marry unbelievers because God knows the trouble it can cause. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership is righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship is light with darkness, what harmony has Christ with Belial or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. Then Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all his household and his livestock and all his cattle and all his goods which he had acquired in the land of Canaan and went to another land away from his brother Jacob. For the property had become too great for them to live together and the land where they sojourned could not sustain them because of the livestock. So Esau lived in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. There came a time when Esau and his family made a decision to depart from the promised land. They moved southward to the area of the south of the Dead Sea, and they settled there. As Moses writes in the book of Genesis, the children of Israel are in the wilderness. They will eventually be heading for the promised land, but to go there, they will have to make a detour. The detour will be around the land of Edom. It will be a detour around the descendants of Esau. The primary purpose of this chapter has already been realised. The first readers of this chapter were the Israelites who were about to cross over the river Jordan to possess the land of Canaan and to annihilate the Canaanites. There were, however, some people who were not to be attacked or annihilated, and among those were the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. The Lord spoke to me, saying, You have circled this mountain long enough. Now turn north and command the people, saying, You will pass through the territory of your brothers, the sons of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful, do not provoke them, for I will not give you any of their land, even as little as a footstep, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. Lest this command be violated, it was most essential for those Israelites of Moses' day to know who the Edomites were and have a careful documented record of the generations of Esau. That record is the substance of chapter 36. It was indispensable for the first readers of this account. This listing of Esau's descendants has given very little in the way of additional material. That's not to say that these people never did anything. Genesis 36-23 mentions a person called Anna, who found the hot springs in the wilderness when he was pasturing his donkeys for his father Zibion. This is a clue that there were a great many events that took place in the lives of these people who worked and played and who married and who raised children. But almost nothing of it is recorded here. As a lesson we can learn from this, it's possible for you to have your life full of all sorts of details of living and yet to be still spiritually empty. What will be said of our life at the end of our days? Was it a life of trivia? Or will it have been a life that was spent in the service of the King of Kings? Will it be a life that was spent in the service of the King of Kings? Now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom, before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. This paragraph sets forth a listing of the kings who reigned over the land of Edom. We are specifically told that these kings reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned in the land of, and uh, reigned over the sons of Israel. This presents us with a problem. If we read that this was before any king reigned over the sons of Israel, then it would seem to presuppose that the author is aware of a time when there would be kings who reigned over the sons of Israel. This statement is used by critics of the Bible to insist that Moses could not have been the author of Genesis. What should we say to such a criticism? There are two possible solutions that have been proposed. Richard Pratt, Professor of Old Testament Reformed Theological Seminary, said, notes, Moses was the author of the major part of the Pentateuch without necessarily being the final editor of each portion of the text. Therefore, Pratt would reason that such a passage as to be found here could well have been added by a later editor and need not be attributed to Moses. Dr. Pratt's solution is within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy and that he continues to hold to such doctrines as inerrancy and inspiration of the scriptures. But perhaps there's an alternative solution. Moses is called a prophet and demonstrates a prophetic understanding that the future of Israel will see a time when it should be governed by kings. Deuteronomy 17:14 is specific 
to say, There shall come a time when the Israelites shall seek to be led by a king. Moses wishes to state for the record that Edom has already embarked upon a policy of being ruled by kings. Why is this particularly significant? It's significant because the desire for a king was not necessarily a good thing. It came from a desire to be like other nations. How many of us have heard the plaintive cry from our children? But all of the other kids are doing it. That usually came when they wanted to do something that we thought might not be in their best interest. The Israelites would eventually do the same thing in the desire to be led by a king rather than God. They would ask the Lord for a king and then much later they would ask the Lord to take a king back. The descendants of Edom are seen here and they are already following in the ways of the world. They appoint for themselves a king merely because everybody else is doing it. Now these are the names of the chiefs descended from Esau according to their families and their localities by their names Chief Dimna, Chief Alva, Chief Zacheth, Chief Ohalabal, Chief Elah, Chief Benon, Chief Kenaz, Chief Titiman, Chief Midzar, Chief Bagdil, Chief Imra or Iram. These are the chiefs of Edom, that is Esau, the father of the Edomites, according to the habitations in the land of their possession. This chapter closes with a listing of some of the chieftains. There were the leaders of some of the tribes who made up the Edomites. As our chapter closes, they are seen carrying on the legacy of Esau. It's a legacy that holds the spiritual backlight in low esteem. It's a legacy of the secular. The rest of the story is found in the last book of the Old Testament. It is found in the words of the Lord in the book of Malachi. I have loved you, said the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. I have made his mountains a desolation, and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. Though Edom says, we have been beaten down, but we will return and build up our ruins. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. The Lord eventually brought a desolation and destruction upon the land of Edom. This was due in part to the fact that Edom set itself up against the people of God when the Babylonians came to destroy Jerusalem. When Nebuchadnezzar went to destroy the temple of God, the people of Edom lined up to cheer and to make a profit at Judah's expense. Obadiah 1.13 speaks of how the Edomites gloated over Judah in the days of her disaster and how they looted their wealth in the day of their distress. Yet, even after this, Edom was given a second opportunity. Many years after the wars of Malachi, a king came to power from the land of Edom. His name was Herod the Great. It was under his reign that Jesus was born. The Lord actually sent Magi from the east to tell Herod about this wonderful event. What was his reaction? They seek to come and worship Jesus. This pretense was exactly that, but it was only a pretense and a sham. In reality, he sought to murder the baby Jesus. In doing so, he was demonstrating the continuing legacy of Esau. It was a legacy of kings who set themselves up in place of God. It was a legacy of the secular. It was a legacy of those who had no interest in the things of the Lord and who were willing to trade away a spiritual heritage for a cup of stew. How about us? Are spiritual things our cup of tea? Or, as they would say in Edom, are they our cup of stew? We have been given an invitation today It's an invitation to come and to worship the King of Kings. If you get anything out of this chapter, feel free to come back and join us again. Every blessing.